are here today with Dan Parker from Montague, Michigan. Um, this interview is part of the Light Lake Environmental History Project. And I uh, do want to ask Dan if he's read the legal release and, and has okayed it. Yes. Okay. And my name is Tanya Kabala. I'm conducting the interview. And Oscar Oslo is um, the, video, the video guy. So, um, Dan, I'd like to start with just a little bit about um, your background. Do you have a family history in the area? Um, you know, what, what's your history in the White Lake area? Uh, my grandfather walked into Muskegon County in the 1840s. Uh, he purchased 160 acres in 1851. Uh, he was married here. I married uh, a, a lady last name of Williamson, married by the black preacher that was uh, uh, had the farm south of Old Channel Trail. Our farm was a link in the Underground Railroad. Uh, so uh, they, he came from Vermont, and he actually went back to got Vermont maples, and we had sugar bush for many, many, many years. Uh, my great grandfather Williamson was a country doctor. My father was the only child of, of, of uh, a grandchild that he didn't deliver. So that goes back to history. My father had a farm uh, and a dairy, Parker's Dairy, Jersey Milk. Uh, he went out of business about the time I was born. Uh, he got his, his uh, herd got uh, diseased and he couldn't recover for it and he bounced around for about six years till he got hired into Hooker. He had various jobs. And uh, I grew up here, went to Montague High School, graduated from Grand Valley, um, moved around the world. <laughs> I've been around uh, uh, Europe and, and, and the United States um, and ended up coming back here and living on the family farm again, which is not far from Hooker. <laughs> Can you describe your earliest memories of White Lake? Swimming in it, fishing in it. Um, we had a friend who had a boat, and we'd go out. Uh, terrifying experience, of course, was one time when we caught a very nice fish, and it had a lamprey eel on it. And that was uh, disgusting. Uh, I, I went up to the bow of the boat and as far away as from the eel as possible <laughs> when they took it off the fish. Uh, yeah, so those are my earliest memories. I love the sailboats on White Lake. Uh, yeah, those were my earliest memories, yeah. So, um, you lived in Montague in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. what, were, what were your thoughts, and maybe those of your families and friend, family members and friends when you first heard of uh, Hooker Chemical and DuPont? Well, for my father, it was, it was stability. Um, he had been a carp, he, he had a buddy who was a carpenter, who later joined him in working at Hooker. Um, uh, he worked at Fisher uh, Scrap Metal. He worked, as most everybody did at the time, off and on at Teledyne. Guys would work, they'd have a boom. Well, right after he lost uh, the farm, uh, there was a war on it. So, you know, they would, he went down and made tanks, okay? Uh, he never got in there permanently, but, you know, there was always jobs. And then it was stability. Uh, it was close. Uh, he got paid well, uh, and so it was, and we got to buy a TV. We were one of the last kids. <laughs> I can still list, remember listening to the radio. I can remember listening to the radio and listening to Dragnet, and that was when I had to go to bed. It was when I was listening to Dragnet. And my brother and I, we had a farm there, and um, we had our own milk. And we would lay on the floor and roll of uh, the butter churn, or the back and forth, to make the butter, and uh, like churning it. So that was one of the things that uh, we did, yes. Do you remember anything that the other people said? You know, maybe friends and neighbors? Well, no, there was, uh, it was all positive. Uh, we got new neighbors. We had people moved into the neighborhood uh, uh, that came with Hooker. Uh, no, it was all, all good, um, uh, you know, because the major, how Matt was the, probably still the largest, and then, of course, the tannery. Uh, DuPont came later, 
Uh, so yeah, otherwise you had to drive to Muskegon, or you were a farmer, so that, or you had a business. But yeah, those were this was something uh, better. Yeah. What did you see changing, if anything, in the community um, due to the companies coming to the area? Um, hmm. I didn't see much. Montague was a you know pretty small town. Uh, I think the new people, the new people we brought. Uh, 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 usually, a lot of the new people, not all of them, but a lot of them, were, uh, parents were uh, engineers or uh, uh, management. Uh, a lot of the, you know, they had lived in Niagara Falls or they had lived in other uh, eastern venues, Pennsylvania, New York. Uh, they were all actually uh, uh, some chemists, so they were always some pretty smart kids, really, uh, that brought to the community, yeah. It brought a little diversity to the, the community. Did you or, or others think that, um, the, that the chemical companies uh, being in the area might affect the resort industry? Uh, not really. The resorts, um, how can I say it, were pretty established at the time. Um, it was only later, you know, in the 60s when there was the possibility, the possibility that it was um, going to be bad news, yeah. What was your understanding of the, the pollution problem when, when those concerns began to emerge? Well, I, I was conflicted because uh, the, uh, the main whistleblower uh, was a fellow I went to school with, and he was kind of a goof. I mean, you know, it's one of those where you, oh boy, and, and uh, uh, who was he? Oh, uh, uh, Eugene uh, Dobson, uh, and he was kind of a, a goof off. Now I knew Wint Dahlstrom, and I liked Wint, and got to know him very well later on. But you know, it was uh, a little bit of the troublemaker thing, and of course. Um, Back then, uh, the local, uh, the newest TV station, Channel 13, was trying to make a name for themselves. So uh, they latched on to this as their, uh, they have always been a little more aggressive and they were the new person on the block and they were always a little more aggressive uh, with West Michigan. Uh, we found out later that some of their executives and some other people had cottages up here. And so they paid a little more attention to <laughs> Muskegon and the White Lake area um, than uh, the Channel 8 and Channel 3 did. Now, your, your dad was still working for Hooker at the time. Exactly. Uh, he retired from there. Uh, I think he, he was 62 or 3, something like I know he took it out early and um, because his father had died young and his brother had died, and his, they both died in the early 60s. And of course, then he lived to be 86. So, <laughs> you know, always the, uh, oh, I'm going to retire now and enjoy life. And then he had a nice long life. And my mother's still alive, and she's 94. So, um, yeah, he, uh, uh, he worked there. He, he got his 20 some years in. Uh, Hooker had, uh, it, it, one of the things I maybe don't realize, Hooker patented and invented the swing shift, the first, second, third shift type thing, because they run, they ran 24/7. And um, my poor father, being a farmer, he was used to getting up quite early and going to bed very early. And if we ever took a trip, um, <laughs> uh, we I learned all the sappy old songs because our radios, most of our cars didn't, the radios didn't work, so we had to sing to them to keep them awake. And so I learned all these songs my parents knew. <laughs> and, you know, down by the old mill stream, that kind of stuff. Well, anyway, uh, once he got working a hooker, he had no problem adjusting to sleep patterns. Uh, after you work first shift for a week, second shift for a week, and then third shift for a week, and then you got a nice long weekend. But yeah, he, he, he never had a problem after that. <laughs> what did your dad do at hooker? He worked inside at first, and I can't. I want to say it was the boiler room, because they had names for everything. Um, 
Uh, that was the swing shift. I want to say it was the boiler room. Uh, you know, there was fine chem, there was the boiler room, there was um, uh, caustic, uh, there was uh, the different parts of it. I can't remember them all now. And he did that for a number of years. And then when he got older, he went to the loading department, which was to load the, uh, they had given up on the barges by then. For some reasons, the barges never worked out uh, cost effectively. So he mostly loaded the uh, trucks and the railroad cars. And he kind of liked it. It was first shift only. So he wanted to uh, get, get off swing shift. Uh, that, uh, he wanted to be on first shift. It was a little less money because you made a better rate working swing shift, but he was getting tired of swing shift, yeah. So when the pollution concerns emerged, what did he think? Oh, he, he thought it was a bunch of hooey. <laughs> he thought it was silly. Um, uh, of course, I don't know. Uh, by that time, I'm trying to think, that all hit about when, 19... Like 70s. Yes, yeah, 70s. And I had already worked there one summer. And uh, so I knew some of the um, abuses there. <laughs> they had a, uh, a section, and it's even on some of the old maps there now, called Lake Neary. It was named after an engineer um, whose last name was Neary. And of course, Lake Erie, Lake Neary. And of course, Lake Erie was quite polluted at the time. And it's gotten better, but yeah. So that was Lake Neary. It was a stretch behind Fine Chem that they had a bunch of chemicals they couldn't get rid of. And they just dumped it out there. And it formed a pond for a long time. And that was called Lake Neary. So they dumped liquid waste? Yep. Yep, that was Lake Neary, yeah, for a while. Because of him. That, he was the guy who ordered it. What did you do at Hooker Chemical? Uh, <laughs> my brothers and I, there's three of us, there was three brothers, we all worked there summers. Uh, if you're, uh, if the mom or dad worked at Hooker and you were going to college and you were 18, I had to wait a year. Uh, a lot of my friends got, they were born a little earlier than I and they got in the first year after graduation. I actually paid great. I paid for two out of my four years of college from that one summer job at Hooker. You got raises. The longer you stay there, every few weeks you got a bump of a dime an hour. Uh, my brother was one of the first ones. He was in with Copoys, this kid. Uh, they were, the, and they painted. Now who's Copoys? Copoys was the president, the big, the big shot at uh, Hooker. And uh, he, started, he started the program. And of course, this kid happened to be one of the first ones to do it. And my brother got lucky. He was with him too. And he, that's what they were at first. And then as it got more popular, uh, I wanted to be a painter because I'm not mechanical. <laughs> and I ended up being a uh, maintenance man. <laughs> I ended up, mostly I handed people wrenches and I ran and got things. And I, uh, I was not, uh, I was a gopher. I was a gopher, yeah. And, uh, but yeah, it was a great summer. Uh, I looked like I was on a summer long jag because my eyes were bloodshot most of the time. One of the gentlemen I worked with, uh, I could always tell where we were going. Because in maintenance, you know, the guy hands out these slips. Mr. Barber would hand out all these slips every morning. And that was your assignment, unless you, it was a, a multiple days assignment. And so uh, where you were gonna go, and I could watch uh, the guy I worked with. You wore your hard hat everywhere. That was a, a given. You didn't go anywhere in Hooker without a hard hat on. But <laughs> if he grabbed the hard hat, the gas mask, and something else, I can't remember what it was. We were going to find him. If we were, uh, <laughs> if he started grabbing the gas mask, I go, uh-oh, we're going to find Kim. And yeah, we were going to find Kim. <laughs> Because that was, uh, yeah. yeah. Can, can you tell us a little more about Fine Chem? Fine Chem was the smelliest, stinkiest uh, uh, place. Um, <laughs> uh, isolated. Uh, that's where they made the C56. Uh, uh, I still call it C56. Everybody else says C56, but it's C56. 
Um, yeah, that was the, in the back of the plant, it was smelly, it was open air. Um, yeah, it, it was the, uh, the rest of the plant wasn't bad, but yeah, like I said, I was constantly getting eye drops because my eyes were always bloodshot. What kind of, um, um, what kind of things did they do in fine chem? That I don't know. They made, they made C5-6, of course, which C5-6, of course, they used in a lot of um, pesticides. And uh, they okay, made chlorine and they, uh, caustic. Uh, and uh, they, a uh, little known fact that their boiler room, one of the reasons DuPont came here was they could buy steam. There was a line that ran to DuPont uh, to power their equipment off a of hooker. Uh, from the boiler room, so they kind of worked together. Now, um, did you ever have any issues when you worked there as far as, I know people talked about chlorine leaks and things. Uh, I had to run a couple times. <laughs> we had to evacuate. I worked across the street at a place called Stax, uh, next to Blueberry Ridge, and I guess now it's a development. And it was an old lodge that uh, had been on White Lake with the fancy elevator that goes down to the water, you know. And uh, this millionaire from Chicago, uh, Mr. Stack, had bought the place and his family, they would come up here and stay summers. And my uncle was the caretaker. Well, one of the last jobs I would have every summer was, and it was a rotten job, was I had, they had a long two-track driveway of of stones, and part of my job was to go out there and rake the leaves away from the, the driveway and the stones back on the driveway. And it would take me all day. Well, there had been a leak the previous winter sometime. A leak of? Something. I have no idea what it was. Well, this is June. I would work there weekends, in the spring for them. And then once school was out there, I worked there most of the month of June. And then the people would come, we'd have the place cleaned up, we'd have all the leaves raked, we'd have the, you know, my cousin, she mowed the lawn and uh, she would come once a week and mow the lawn, but that was it. So it was a kind of a short-term job and I was maybe 13. Well, I'm out in the woods there, it's all pines. And there was always lots of squirrels tons of squirrels, and there was always lots of uh, birds. Well, I noticed a few dead trees, but this year the only birds were the migratory birds. The only birds out there were the robins. The only birds out there were the blackbirds. There were no cardinals. <laughs> uh, there were no blue jays. Uh, it was amazingly quiet. You know, it makes me think of Silent Spring you know, Rachel Carson, because, uh, yeah, it was spooky. Did you have another time where oh. there was a, a leak where you had to evacuate? Yeah, oh, this one was interesting. It was after my father first started working there, and it was a Sunday afternoon, and when we were kids, uh, we, my folks never went to movies. Uh, we got TVs, they never went to movies. Entertainment was a, uh, and a kind of fun thing, was would take a ride. And my father never ceased to amaze us. He would take us on a ride somewhere and we'd go off in the backwoods on two tracks on roads we'd never seen before. I mean, we knew the lakeshore all the way to Ludington. I knew every two track and every road uh, north of Montague all the way to Ludington from a kid. But you go off toward Mesquite or uh, Nuevo and those areas out there, he would take us off in those directions and, and he hunted and fished out there. And, we had hardly ever been there. We'd go to beautiful rollaways over the Muskegon River. We'd take rides. Well, all of a sudden, we get a phone call, and he answers the phone, and uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And, okay, kids, we're going for a ride. <laughs> we took off. Jumped in the car, yay, we took off, because we knew if we took off on a ride, we'd end up someplace where we'd either get a nice meal or some a hot fudge sundae or something like that. It was kind of cool. And it must have been during school. It must have been in the fall or, or spring. I can't remember which. So we took off on this unexpected, boom, ride. 
Well, it was fun. I got back, and the next day I went to school, Sunday, and I got talking with my friends who lived up and down Whitbeck, two of them, uh, one male, one female, and they too went for a ride that Sunday afternoon. Uh, and we asked, started asking questions. Of course, we were like, oh, seven, eight, nine. We were pretty precocious. And uh, there had been a leak. And so they had called the employees that lived, of course, the prevailing wind is out of the south, and we lived north of Hooker on Wetback. And uh, now, and then of course, we're all sitting around going, well, what about all our neighbors? What about our friends? You know, they did not have the... You know, they didn't work at Hooker. They didn't get that phone call. But uh, nothing ever came of it. Nobody ever got sick or anything. But, oh, yeah, my dad said, oh, yeah, we just took a ride, you know. So that was kind of disconcerting. You know, it's like, you know, you think, oh, well, that was nice, but what about all the other kids on the block, you know? So, yeah, that was kind of, uh, they, had, they took care of their own, I should say, um, yeah, I, you, know, you talk to the other kids and they go, yeah, we took a ride too. Did you ask your dad about it? Well, he was, he thought it was like a perk. <laughs> he thought it was like a perk. He was like, well, I get forced warning, you know. You know, uh, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, he, he thought it was, oh, you know, they take care of us, you know. <laughs> Paternalistic, you know, kind of thing. Well, you, um, you've mentioned that you kind of liked being what you call a hooker kid. Yeah, I mentioned, uh, yeah, the fact that they had parties for us. Uh, they had Christmas parties. They, they would rent the park theater in Montague on a Saturday morning before Christmas and show nothing but cartoons. And uh, free popcorn, you gorge yourself. And then at the end, uh, one of the more rotund people would come in and play Santa Claus and pass out gifts. And they were all individual. I mean, they knew who was coming. So yeah, they call your name, and you got came up and got your um, gift, you know, uh, male or female or whatever. And then um, you know, then your parents came and picked you up. Summertime, they had picnics. The picnics were always at a nice park like Pioneer or down at uh, Mona Lake. They had uh, rides. Uh, the big hit was, of course, the sand pit or thought us like, they took coins, you know, mostly pennies, but then they knew, you knew that somewhere in there was a silver dollar or two. So, you know, you know, you jumped on that. And, and, and they had uh, beer for the men. One time uh, they would have a free beer, and of course they had free ice cream cones and stuff like that, things kids liked. Uh, uh, some, one time I remember having at that old Channel Trail golf course, the men played golf, and, and they had the tents set up there, and they took over the whole, whole well, all nine holes back then. <laughs> it's not the 27 that it is now. But yeah, they took over the golf course for the day. When, um, when the concerns about pollution were emerged, what, what were your feelings? I was conflicted. I was in college by then. Long hair, kind of a radical, and it got quizzed about it quite, you know. <laughs> and yeah, I was very conflicted. And then I sort of switched over uh, somewhere in there because I've gotten, I started taking um, science classes, <laughs> and a lot of my friends were environmental science majors. And then some of the stories started emerging um, amongst some of the people. And um, but you've got to remember, by this time, somewhere in there, we didn't swim in White Lake anymore. We only swam in Lake Michigan. Sometime between the time I was a little kid and my mom took me to the bathing beach, uh, that ended. Uh, we only swam in Lake Michigan and Stony Lake. We never swam in White Lake anymore. Um, uh, yeah, I realized that, that we didn't... Uh, spend any time down there. Uh, the attitude, and I started taking environmental science, I learned about pollution, I learned about various other things, and I realized that, and of course, that was leading up to, you know, their eventual departure. Um, and yeah, uh, 
uh, of course, everybody in the 70s, you know, um, it was becoming more environment, environmentally aware, Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act. Richard Nixon, the environmental president. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so the 70s was an awakening, obviously. What, um, did your dad's feelings change? Nope, never hardly ever did. Uh, he thought Hooker was great. Um, yeah, he never hardly ever did. Uh, it was kind of like everybody did it <laughs> type of attitude. So uh, he was aware of the pollution? But... Yeah, I'm sure he was. I'm sure he was. Um, yeah, I'm sure he was uh, to an extent, yeah. Mm -hmm. But he never um, blamed the company. No, the company was, like I said, very good to him. I mean, uh, 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 he was a union steward, even though, steward, excuse me, uh, even though he never was, one of, they never had a strike or anything. He, he mostly did it just to keep the hotheads out. <laughs> that was his, uh, so yeah. Um, no, he was uh, very right up to the end. He thought Hooker was great, yeah. And of course, you have to realize when they left, uh, my brother got laid off. My brother was there by then, and he got laid off, and uh, uh, that type of thing. So yeah, uh, uh, and of course, they had other perks. They had a credit union that was uh, great, uh, you know, if you, emergency loans or car loans and stuff like that, which got absorbed, of course, into how that credit union. But yeah, uh, there were perks with a company like that. We were going through a transitionary period. We were losing a lot of the old time um, touristy type people. It used to be around White Lake, there was your rich people and your, uh, that had places, but there was a lot of resorts why do you think the resorts were in a decline? Uh, just a change of, of um, uh, the resorts were in decline because of transportation. It was easier. The resorts were, you came for a long time. You just didn't, you know, coming up old 31 from Chicago or coming across the state from Detroit was <laughs> a major thing. I can remember visiting my aunt in Chicago and it was Two-track, two-lane two uh, two highway the whole way, traffic jams, we, hated, we had to go right through Benton Harbor, you went right through Chicago, I mean, we were going to Hinsdale. Taking a trip to Chicago or Detroit was a big deal. When transportation changed. Yes. Now you could take day trips. You could, uh, there was motels, there was uh, that kind of thing. The resort, um, uh, there's still a few of them around. Michelin, of course, now is gone. Uh, but yeah, the reason, you know, I, 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 and I think possibly part of it was uh, uh, we still have a lot of Chicago people, but a lot of the Chicago people bought places up here after a while. Uh, but you don't know how many people I have talked to that used to uh, come up here with their family and then stayed at a resort and then all of a sudden they got some money and want to get to retire or and then bought a place or maybe they didn't work retire they were still working yeah do you think um, pollution had an impact on that possibly um, it wasn't um, how can I say it uh, by then people were discovering Traverse City which is very pristine and very they were going further north um, but yeah, I think it partially dropped off because of some of that. I know the boating, uh, I mean, the yacht club was still viable, but you know, you weren't uh, swimming in White Lake like you used to. Uh, you know, <laughs> the bathing beach, say in Montague, you still don't see a lot of people down there swimming. But you know, I can remember when I was a kid, it was pretty popular, you know. Did you take any action during the time these pollution concerns were? No, launched? nope. I was in Grand Rapids. I was going to college. Um, uh, my friends were, you know. Um, what were they doing? Oh yeah, well they were picketing. They were uh, <laughs> uh, getting arrested and, and all sorts of good things. They were, 
yeah, they were becoming quite militant. Uh, yeah, they were they were uh, they were mad. They were a little betrayed. Yeah, they were doing lots of things. Yeah, they were. Uh, yeah, they were. Uh, uh, and of course, there was lots of you know conflict. Uh, you know. Well, what did you think of your friends in the protest? Oh, I thought I, I thought it was kind of cool. I mean, I thought it was. Uh, you know, they were they were standing up for what they believed in and that kind of thing. But yeah. Um, yeah, so that was kind of cool. Um, were you aware of any of the visible effects of the pollution? Uh, outside of some, de you know, dead trees, um, visible? No, uh, it's hard to. Uh, you knew that uh, fisheries-wise, it's hard to discern about White Lake because. Some of the fisheries went away. Um, uh, how can I say this? Uh, but that was a normal trend. How can I, uh, uh, like the white? What was it the white bass? There used to be. It was used to have a. My father tells stories about. Um, it was kind of like the. Um, come on, the pigeon. The passenger uh, pigeons, similar, or the grayling. Uh, they would have this huge run up White Lake and up the river, and you'd go down and just catch, I don't even know they had a limit on them, and catch tons of them. Then the, they aren't around anymore. They're gone. Uh, so there was changes. Uh, of course, we didn't have the fish. We didn't have salmon. We didn't have steelhead. That was just coming in, or the steelhead were around, but the, the salmon wasn't around just starting but yeah they were just um, so yeah the fisheries I think the fishery uh, downturn was part of it uh, you were always a little suspicious of the fish you caught out of White Lake it was always a little suspicious you talk to the guys these walleye guys that go over to Saginaw Bay and uh, they catch and release they don't keep their fish they don't eat them what um did you have any specific concerns yourself about the pollution and the effect on either your family or the community? Not really. My ex used to laugh. She says, your dad's got to be, he worked at Hooker. He eats all the salmon out of Lake Michigan. <laughs> and what, and uh, he used to smoke, so he should be dead by now. You know, he was one of the healthiest people you've ever wanted to meet. Uh, yeah, he should have been dead a long time ago. But... Um, no, uh, you always wonder, of course, see, in my family, I have uh, uh, the, uh, uh, I had a cousin that died, was the first person to die from art chemical, uh, and I had another cous uh, cousin that also worked there that also died from cancer. So those were the really bad places. Um, yeah, those were the really bad places. It was interesting, Hooker had a death on the job and DuPont had one death on the job from uh, accidents. What was your viewpoint of the companies? Well, you know, the fact that, that they polluted everything and then pulled out. <laughs> and of course, you know, um, part of it, um, chemical, or we found out later, chemical companies do this all the time. They, uh, a chemical becomes popular and, it, it, and then you find out about the side effects or uh, in DuPont's case I think what was it they were making uh, they could make cheaper and off a of waste product or something uh, neoprene or whatever it was um, you know chemicals um, and some of the uh, things that we make uh, have you know short lives? <laughs> you know they 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 uh, they become the popular thing for a while, and then they find something better, uh, another scientific breakthrough, and all of a sudden, what seemed like a very stable industry wasn't anymore. Um, yeah, uh, like well, I, it's still a, a market for chlorine, of course, but that was about all Hooker would have left was chlorine, like for the paper mill, of course now the paper mill's gone.
Do you um, do you think people's viewpoint of, of the chemical industry has changed? Oh, definitely, time? definitely. Uh, <laughs> uh, some of the horror stories, uh, because people get so insulated to it. Uh, I had a friend of mine that lived on the Rogue River below uh, Wolverine Worldwide. Uh, the hush puppy people, uh, they could tell every day what color they were hush puppies they had done the day before. If the river ran red, it was red. Some days it would run blue. And people grew up around the Grand River where I lived in Spring Lake. You know, they knew every time it rained in Grand Rapids that there was things floating down the river, you know, unmentionables. Uh, uh, John Schultz, a friend of mine, is the director of parks in Ottawa County. He, he was in Saginaw and below Dow, and, and, and that was just the norm, you know? People get, and then all of a sudden they go, wait a minute, this isn't right, you know? <laughs> what was your viewpoint of government um, during this time, and has that changed? Well, uh, actually I got, you know, that they made it, you know, uh, what they did with the vault, uh, some of the things, the EPA came down hard, which they should have. Um, uh, and, you know, they're under a, a what is it? Consent order. Yeah, consent order. They have to um, abide to. And, uh, you know, that was good. Uh, they got a lot of attention. Uh, of course, they got the secondary attention, of course, from uh, Love Canal because they were part of the organization. Uh, so yeah, they have uh, uh, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, you know, actually the EPA came through, you know, uh, in that respect. State of Michigan, eh, uh, state of Michigan's a little, uh, of course I've lost a lot of respect for them lately, but that's another story. Um, are you aware of efforts to clean up White Lake? Oh, of course. You know, uh, the PAC has done a great job. Um, uh, the Conservation District, the different agencies have made a concerted effort uh, and done a great job. Of, and of course, Muskegon Lake is getting cleaned up also. But yeah, uh, it has become because uh, our economy is changing. We've lost our industry. We have to uh, try to attract people now. Cast flies, mayflies, hatching all over the place. And of course, if you know water ecology, macroinvertebrates, they don't live in dirty water. They have to have clean water. Uh, and they were all over Montague Foods around the lights, and they were all around Wesco. And uh, so that was a good indicator of uh, good water quality um, coming back. Um, and I think some of our... Um, Upstream, I think some of the, uh, uh, they got a little smarter with some of our farming. We don't have the salary fields up there like we did before with some of the uh, pollution running down. Uh, that has uh, gone away. So they still farm up there, but it's not the, uh, the old type farming like they used to do. So that's helped. But I think that the water quality is coming back. What, um... What do you think the community needs to do as far as um, environmental protection in White Lake? Uh, make sure that whatever, uh, when, uh, of course, we're going to have a lot of dredging uh, going on with the low water levels. Uh, be careful where you dredge because, uh, uh, because there could be down under there, <laughs> you start messing around. Uh, you know, some of these things, uh, some of these spots are silted over. You could, uh, you know, we could, you know, inadvertently dig up something that might be uh, hazardous to our health. Uh, because, yeah, we're seeing, we're seeing things out there. I, I've been, um, I'm seeing things that I haven't seen since the, oh, 63, 64 when the water levels were really, you know, this low before. So yeah, we have to be really careful because there's some things exposed and some potential uh, hazards down there that uh, have been laying dormant. What do you think as far as long term? Oh, I think we're in a, in a good situation where uh, uh, we've got uh, a lot of uh, 
good attributes around here. We have, you know, um, uh, and we're we're being a little more. Uh, Uh, how can I say, consumer friendly, this place, this place would have never existed around, you know, Book Nook would have never existed around here, what would you say, 10 years ago, 15 years ago? I doubt it. It would never have, and now it's a success, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the dis, you know, it, it's taking a part of the big city and bringing it to the small town and the, the people like it and it's, uh, you know, uh, we're adjusting our economy to accommodate these people because we have lost our industry. Helmet's still healthy, but yeah, we've, we've lost a lot of that. So so you're suggesting that maybe the people are being attracted to the area for, yeah. their, for other reasons? Other reasons, but White Lake's still a draw. It's still pretty, it's still beautiful, it's still, uh, um, you know, it's uh, six miles long and it's, uh, uh, you know, now we've got the tannery off, <laughs> off of the front of it, so that kind of thing. Uh, it, it's looking better. It's looking better all the time. Was well, there anything you would like to add that I haven't asked you? No, uh, I thought this was great. Uh, I, of course, I used to teach history, so uh, I love this kind of stuff. I think uh, because how many times lately has there been a question and you go, if so and so was here, they could have answered it. Well, so and so isn't here anymore. Wint Dahlstrom. Wint would have known, you know, but Wint's not here anymore. Is Betty still alive? By the way, no, no. I mean, you know, uh, so this is the kind of stuff, a lake. My letter to the editor that I'm going to turn in today is about a legacy. What is going to be our legacy? People make mistakes all the time. I do. I make mistakes all the time, but it's how well you make up for them that's important, you know. And so, uh, uh, and we're making up for you know our past mistakes. Uh, luckily, some of these sites are not orphan sites. The companies are still viable. They still the purge pumps are still working. Uh, they're still. Uh, uh, you know, being able to, uh, not like some of the other chemical companies in Skegan, which are defunct and bankrupt, they're gone and whatever. And they have, you know, all we have left is the government, you know. <laughs> and luckily, these companies are still viable. Is that it? Well, thank you very much. Okay, Dave. super. Won't take up too much of your time here. <laughs> That's a wrap, right? That's a wrap.